We left Matilda caught in the centre of events after her father's death, still stuck in her French border fortresses with her sons. But a final falling out between Robert of Gloucester, her half-brother, and Stephen I, now King of England, was all it took for tensions to bubble over and for Robert to publicly declare for Matilda. England was now to be in the grip of civil war, the 19-year anarchy as it was later named. It had taken Matilda four years to gather support and resources, but in 1139 she finally set foot on English soil. Her husband Geoffrey was still focused on claiming lands in Normandy, but now she had the backing of her half-brother Robert, it gave her the military might she would need to claim the throne. But more importantly, it seems Matilda now understood that if her fight for the crown were to have any hope of winning, she would need to be seen as the figurehead, a hereditary heir of royal blood. Robert's defection now also made the crossing of the Channel easier, through his lands at Caen, only 50 miles from her base at Argenton. Crossing to England was made difficult by the fact that Stephen held control over the harbours along the south coast, but there was a chink in his defences. Arundel Castle, a towering fortress which had its own port, was now home to King Henry I's widow, Adeliza, stepmother to Matilda. She was now remarried to William de Albany, who had been one of Henry's most trusted household attendants, now an ardent supporter of Stephen. While Adeliza and her second husband were publicly loyal to Stephen, it isn't hard to imagine that she must have felt some sympathy to Matilda's cause. The two had grown fond of each other by spending time together after Matilda's return from Germany, and eight-year-old Matilda's first act as the German Queen had been to intercede on behalf of Adeliza's father and aid the return of his fortunes, no doubt creating a debt of gratitude. On the 30th of September 1139, a ship slipped quietly into the port of Arundel. The ex-Queen Adeliza welcomed both Matilda and her half-brother Robert to enjoy her hospitality. Stephen immediately marched his forces to surround Arundel Castle, but Robert of Gloucester had already left quietly to his estate at Bristol, leaving his half-sister behind. Although her sex had meant she had been, so far, easily overlooked for the throne of England, it was now to her advantage. As a noble woman of royal blood, Stephen was unable to capture or kill her for simply arriving at her stepmother's home, and as Adeliza protested there had been no invite, but merely that she was providing hospitality, she was also exempt from any annoyance on Stephen's behalf. It's also clear from the Gesta Stefani that Stephen didn't consider Matilda to be any threat, stating that he focused all his efforts on the capture of the Earl. Leaving a force to surround Arundel Castle, he sped off in pursuit of the Earl of Gloucester, the only one of the party he could legitimately attack, especially as Robert had publicly denounced the King. There is a further interesting part to the Gesta Stefani, the states that Stephen's brother Henry actually had all the byroads blocked by guards and at length met the Earl, it was rumoured, and after a compact of peace and friendship had been firmly ratified between them, let him go unharmed. Although it states it is a rumour, the author seems to suggest they believe its truth by its inclusion. If this was true, and upon his return to his brother's side at Arundel he said nothing, it makes Henry a large part of the reasons behind the civil war that followed. This is an even more interesting story when combined with the fact that he argued to Stephen that he should allow Matilda to join Robert of Gloucester in Bristol, since he would then be able to fight against an enemy in a single place, rather than watching his back for Matilda. Reluctantly, the king agreed, giving orders that Matilda would travel to her half-brother under the watchful eye of Bishop Henry himself and Welleran of Moulin, an escort which was not the custom of honourable knights to refuse to anyone, William of Malmesbury pointed out, even their bitterest enemy. Henry of Huntingdon also points out that the king probably understood it would be difficult to keep soldiers 
at the heavily fortified Arundel Castle and go after Robert at the same time. Bishop Henry's actions, especially if the rumoured story of his secret pact with Robert is to be believed, is likely due to a diminished position in his brother's favour. Henry would likely have expected in due course, when the position for Archbishop of Canterbury was open, to be given this as reward for his efforts. But instead he found himself passed over for the Abbot Theobald of Beck, who had a close association with the Beaumont twins, Welleron of Moulin and Robert of Leicester. They in turn had a strong influence over Stephen that had grown over the years. It is possible that Bishop Henry might see his efforts could be better spent elsewhere if the opportunity arose. Matilda was now in a stronger position than she had been waiting in France. She was present in the country she had inherited the crown for, and although she was now headed for a castle that was soon to be a target, those who had sympathy for her cause could rally around her. There is debate over how much of that support was actually centred on her personally, and whether much of it was for loyalty for her father, and indeed, how much the Earl of Gloucester's public allegiance had propelled others to do the same. And those who had quietly seen no other way forward but to declare loyalty to Stephen now leapt at the chance to switch sides. Two of these men who were to be integral to her campaign were Brian Fitzcount and Miles of Gloucester. These two men had served her father well and had been given important lands and estates in return. Now they aim to repay that loyalty by supporting Henry's daughter and legitimate heir. Both men would prove to be loyal as their castles were tested in sieges set by Stephen, as Fitzcount found his castle at Wallingford surrounded. Miles of Gloucester was a brilliant military strategist. He marched his soldiers behind the King's own, moving on them at Wallingford and destroying the forts they had set up there. With Fitzcount now liberated, Miles could march on London. When the news reached the king, Stephen raced back to protect the capital, while Miles moved swiftly north to attack Worcester, lands belonging to Walleron of Moulin, a supporter of the king. By the time the king heard what had happened there and came to the aid of the city, he found Miles had left it weeks earlier, devastated and in ruin. This was an exhausting sequence that repeated itself throughout the Civil War. Matilda and Robert's supporters had much smaller forces that couldn't fully beat back Stephen's larger army, but they could keep him busy and unable to establish a secure base by attacking and darting away before being caught. They couldn't be lured out into decisive battles and yet were too strong for him to win a definitive victory against. This soon settled into a long cold war, but it gave Matilda time to build her support Miles of Gloucester welcomed her into his castle, and she spent much of her time there over the next decade in Gloucester. Rather than being part of her brother's retinue, she was now head of her own royal household. One can only imagine how it felt to have power and prestige within her fingertips again, and while she was unable to give tangible rewards to her supporters, she could give promises of future privileges once she was crowned queen. The outcome of this civil war for the surrounding population and countryside was devastating. The Norman castles, which had been built little over half a century earlier to dominate its new population, now became eyes at the centre of many storms, which struck the surrounding farms and countryside, using up resources to feed garrisons or destroyed by hostile armies. A land that had been united under a new king was now broken into many parts, some holding allegiance to Matilda and Robert, some to Stephen, and others still held by local barons who kept their allegiances balanced somewhere in between as they held back on choosing a side. Bishop Henry, perhaps acting out of self-interest, perhaps in light of realising he had helped to trigger a cold war between his brother and Matilda, decided to be the bringer of peace. He presided over a meeting at Bath between the Earl of Gloucester and Stephen's Queen, Matilda of Boulogne. 
before he travelled to France to consult King Louis VII and his and Stephen's elder brother, Thibault of Blois. There is no record of what terms he returned with, but Matilda, conscious that she was still politically in the weaker position, was willing to accept them, but Stephen was not. It is likely that Stephen was confident of his position as commander of his forces. After all, Matilda, a woman, could never do the same, instead needing to send her half-brother in her stead to head her army. But for the same reason, he could never capture or kill her in battle either. For Stephen, however, he could not say the same. The man who finally pushed the stalemate into open warfare was actually the son-in-law of Robert of Gloucester, the Earl of Chester, Ranulf de Guernon. While he had so far declared his support somewhat weakly for Stephen, he was also a man far more interested in making territorial gains for himself. While the king was kept busy elsewhere, he saw an opportunity to take Lincoln Castle for himself. Both he and his half-brother, William de Romare, had a claim to Lincoln Castle through their mother Lucy, who was the daughter of the sheriff and castellan of the castle. He created a plan in which his wife, along with William de Romare's, went to pay a social call on the lady of the castle. When he himself arrived to escort her home, he immediately dropped the act, and his men took the castle from the inside, permitting no one through the gates except William de Romare's waiting troops. The king actually didn't act immediately on this transgression, perhaps deciding that attacking a nobleman who was still supposedly on his side was too much on top of repelling those loyal to Matilda, especially as attacking the castle's defences would probably lead to another long, drawn-out siege. It is also possible that he accepted the claim they had made, as there is evidence he accepted it and moved the current earl, William of Albany, to Sussex to allow this. It would seem that the king had taken the castle into his own hands before these events, and that the half-brothers had, therefore, taken it from him. It is not certain what Stephen had gained from the agreement made with them, but William of Malmesbury verifies that a peace had been made. However, it was the townspeople themselves who wrote to Stephen, and informed him about the cruel behaviour towards them from their new lord, and also that he and his family were spending Christmas at the castle with very little protection. Acting speedily on this information, Stephen immediately turned his troops in the direction of Lincoln Castle and attacked it. Leaving his wife behind in the castle, Ranulph had already made haste for his estates further northwest, sending word to his father-in-law that he was willing to change his support to Matilda if he had help to regain Lincoln Castle. While Robert was probably somewhat unimpressed with his son-in-law's sudden turnaround in allegiance, especially as his daughter had now been left in a besieged castle, it was nevertheless a turning point that could be an asset for Matilda's cause. Earl Robert and Earl Ranulph surprised the king by landing outside Lincoln's walls with a much larger army than the king's own forces. His advisers urged him to retreat and regroup. But Stephen refused, perhaps thinking on his own father's retreat at the Siege of Antioch, which led to his father being disgraced, or perhaps he thought he could hold them back with the castle's defences. As might be expected at the time, the chroniclers filled their accounts of Stephen preparing to fight with portents of impending disaster. On the night before the armies met, a great storm filled the night skies, hailstones pounding against the ground, the thunder and lightning lasting for hours. When Stephen attended a service in Lincoln's Grand Cathedral the next morning to pray and celebrate the Feast of Candlemas, the candle he was holding flickered and died, then broke in his hands. During the service, the pyx containing the consecrated host fell from the chain that supported it, falling upon the altar, this, Henry of Huntingdon wrote with doom-laden hindsight, was a sign of the king's downfall. <laughs>
However, aside from fears of being called a coward, Stephen had other reasons to continue on with an attack. Likely, he was still angry at Robert's betrayal, and he knew he was in the approaching army. The citizens of Lincoln were also formed into a militia, which would have bolstered his numbers, although it's unlikely they were well armed. But against him was the fact he had, unlike other battles, the smaller force, trapped by a larger army. The Earls of Gloucester, Chester and Miles of Gloucester brought their military might with them. If Stephen could win this fight, he would crush Matilda's attempts for the crown. The Jester Stefani says, He refused to sully his fame by the disgrace of flight, but went boldly to meet them outside the town. Therefore, on the 2nd of February, 1141, the king led his forces to the west of the city, while the Anduin forces arrived to the north of the ford that surrounded the fortress. While it is uncertain how good the militia Stephen had drawn from the townsfolk of Lincoln were, the infantry of the royalist forces was superior to those of the Anduin army. But the main difference for the Anduin side was their cavalry forces. They had come prepared for a battle. Stephen, with just a small siege force, had not. It's also possible that the commanders of both armies gave a significant advantage for their forces. It's likely that Robert of Gloucester led the Anduin forces. Oderic Vitalis says he was the greatest in the army, and John of Hexham called him the general and organiser of the battle. On the royalist side, King Stephen led his own forces, and while this would prove to be a mistake on his part, it probably gave his men the willingness to face the battle. Henry of Huntingdon tells us, the two forces raised their voices in shouts, while trumpets blared out loudly announcing the start of battle, and the earth shook with the trampling of horses. The start of the battle devastated the poorly armed Welsh forces of Robert of Gloucester, who were quickly forced to leave the battlefield but the stronger cavalry forces of the Angevin army remained put, and the Jester Stefani states that Wallerin of Moulin and William of Ypres fled before coming to close quarters, which suggests that Robert's forces had a highly effective archery unit. Drawn apart by their attack on the Welsh fighters, the Royalist cavalry was now splintered and attacked easily by Robert of Gloucester's forces. Henry of Huntingdon also tells us that William of Ypres, as an experienced general, perceived the impossibility of supporting the king. William of Ypres wasn't just an experienced captain for Stephen, but also a loyal one. Leaving the battlefield in this way would suggest the hopelessness of Stephen's possibility of winning the battle. Many wiser men on the field could see the futility of the king's decision and took the chance to make changes. William of Ypres and the others considered that the only option was to flee in order to fight another day. When William left, he obviously considered defeat inevitable. At some point during the battle, Stephen's sword broke and a citizen of Lincoln handed him a battle axe, a weapon which, to Anglo-Norman eyes, would be rather antiquated and more familiar to Anglo-Saxons. Robert of Tourney attested that Stephen fought on like a lion, grinding his teeth and foaming at the mouth like a boar. When the weapon once more broke, he was at last put out of his misery by being struck by a rock and falling to the ground. Not dead, however, but merely knocked unconscious, he was captured by the victors and first taken under guard 140 miles southwest to face Matilda at Gloucester Castle and then on to her half-brother's fortress at Bristol. There, he was initially treated well and with respect, but after he was found wandering outside of his designated area, especially at night, outside his appointed place of custody, after deceiving or winning over his guards, as William of Malmesbury explains, this persuaded Earl Robert to keep the king chained in irons. This was an uncomfortable situation. While winning a battle was seen as divine intervention, 
keeping an anointed king locked in chains cannot have sat well with either side. It finally seemed as though everything had fallen into place for Matilda. Five long years had passed since her father's death and the usurpation of her crown, and at last all that was left was to be coronated queen. When Stephen was first brought before her at Gloucester, it's likely it was the first time they had seen one another in the flesh since he had knelt before her and publicly proclaimed fealty to her future position as ruler. But like so many of the events in Matilda's life, the chroniclers fall silent, leaving no details as to how Matilda received the man who had taken her inheritance from her. Considering her cool and regal approach to most recorded events in her life, and the anger that can be imagined on her part, it probably wasn't a happy meeting. Even if she could swallow the story that Stephen had taken the throne only to provide stability for England, his resistance to give up the crown and the breaking of his oath were more than enough to see him imprisoned. Matilda and Geoffrey did not sit idly this time in the wake of their victory. The Count of Anjou had already made strong inroads into the territories of Normandy, and now he took others with greater speed planning to annex the duchy in Matilda's name. Meanwhile in England, support for Stephen was faltering in the face of his defeat. His supporters either left their castles at the sword point of Matilda's forces, or decided to switch sides and support her claim in the face of reality. It looked as though Stephen no longer had the claim he once had. The battle at Lincoln had changed the political situation and now it looked as though Matilda, with Stephen in chains, had the upper hand. Nobles who had territorial and dynastic claims to worry about, both in England and France, had to think about who was now most likely to grant royal acceptance of these claims. Those who did not support Matilda, if she were to become queen, would likely lose their lands. But to actually wear the crown, Matilda needed the backing of the church as well as the might of her supporters' armies. And there was one man whose support she would need the most. King Stephen's brother, Henry, the Bishop of Winchester and the Pope's legate in England. Here, Bishop Henry's earlier possible secret pact with Robert and his advice to allow Matilda to travel to her brother seemed to have come to fruition. Perhaps during their long ride to Bristol, albeit with Wallerin of Moulin nearby, there may have been discussions for what might be needed. They met on the 2nd of March near Winchester, and Matilda swore that she would consult with Henry on all matters of government. He, in turn, gave his allegiance and handed her the keys to what was left of the treasury, much smaller than it had been in the wake of many battles and sieges. A month later, William of Malmesbury tells us, Bishop Henry gave a speech to a council of the church at his cathedral in Winchester to speak for her cause. He claimed that although Henry I had indeed named Matilda his heir, it had been too difficult to wait for her to arrive as queen since she was delayed in Normandy, and that Stephen was allowed to become king so long as provision was made for peace in England. He then further explained, without blinking an eye, that King Stephen had sold churches and abbeys, taken their spoils, arrested bishops, and the advice of the wicked was hearkened to, that of the good either not put into effect or altogether disregarded. The council discussed the matter and eventually came to the conclusion that it was Matilda, not Stephen, who should now rule. She was given the title of Lady of England, Anglorum Dominia. This may have been a fairly vague title next to Queen, but it suggested that she had dominium, power, over England. All that remained was for Matilda to travel to Westminster and receive the crown with full ceremony. The stage was set for England's first female monarch who would rule in her own stead. Matilda was now central to her story, and that put her in the spotlight for much of the bitterness many chroniclers felt at the idea of a woman behaving as a female king. 
painting her as a proud and haughty woman. Henry of Huntingdon described her as having an insufferable arrogance, and the jester Stefani recorded her as mightily puffed up and exalted in spirit. It is somewhat disappointing that many modern historians have also tarred Matilda's history with the same brush, declaring her to have been proud and willful at the moment when she had England within her grasp. But not all chroniclers did actually speak ill of her. William of Malmesbury showed no criticism of that formidable lady. Indeed, that phrase suggests an admiration for her actions, and that the abbot of Gloucester, Gilbert Foliot, supplied a glowing defence of Matilda's claim, in which he portrayed the former empress as a devoted royal daughter. He stated that, in accordance with her father's wishes, she crossed the sea, passed over mountains, penetrated into unknown regions, married there at her father's command, and remained there, carrying out the duties of imperial rule virtuously and piously until, after her husband's death, not through any desperate need or feminine levity, but in response to a summons from her father, she returned to him. And though she had attained such high rank that it is reported she had the title and status of Queen of the Romans, she was in no way puffed up with pride, but meekly submitted in all things to her father's will. She had definitely done her duty. Shipped off at eight years old to live out a public life as a German queen, agreeing reluctantly to a second distasteful marriage, and finally producing not one, but three male heirs, Matilda had done all that could be asked of a royal Norman woman. The author of the Gesta Stefani takes the opportunity to portray their true feelings on Matilda and the way she presented herself. She at once put on an extremely arrogant demeanour instead of the modest gait and bearing proper to the gentle sex, and that, in the capital of the land subject to her, she actually made herself queen of all England and gloried in being so called. While the Gesta Stefani was written very obviously to support Stephen's version of events, it is also written by an author who clearly disliked the idea of a woman holding power in her own right. Matilda was not attempting to become a queen in the manner of its original Anglo-Saxon word, but as a female king, to reign over England herself without her husband. Male kings were not meant to carry themselves modestly or gently, rather they would be respected for being commanding and authoritarian. One of Stephen's weak points had been his gentle and charming nature, which had prevented him from being ruthless at times he could have been. Her own father had been known as a king who held complete sway over his subjects and nobles, and expected complete and total obedience in the face of his authority. Her grandfather, William the Conqueror, had deemed himself King of England by taking it with force and an iron fist. It was surely ridiculous to expect Matilda to follow on this royal line by being meek-mannered and proper to the gentle sex. From her ease with regal commands and her comfort with fighting for her crown, it would appear that Matilda's character was likely closer to that of her father's but this was now being used as a reason to dislike her future rule. Matilda found herself in an uncomfortable place. She had been unable, as Stephen had, to show she was a legitimate ruler by commanding an army because of being a woman. It was another reminder of the ways in which she could be held back by her sex, even at this point. And now she had a chance to show how she could command her subjects, she was met with disgust rather than amazement. Her behaviour was characterised as unfeminine and therefore something to be despised. Ironically, similar behaviour in Stephen's wife, Matilda of Boulogne, was spoken of in glowing terms by the Gesta Stefani, stating that she had risen above the limits of her sex. How it must have felt to be derided for the same behaviour a rival was lauded for can only be imagined. As she arrived triumphantly at Westminster to plan her coronation, 
The Jester Stefani also remarked that she refused to agree with everything the chief men of the whole kingdom advised her to do, rebuffing them by an arrogant answer. The idea that she should bow down to her advisers and do exactly as they told her to would have been an abhorrent idea to any male ruler, and yet Matilda was expected to do just that, lest she appear haughty and arrogant. The second instance in which Matilda's manner was brought into question was when she summoned London's wealthiest citizens and asked them for large sums of money to contribute to her royal purse, something that Stephen had enjoyed when lavish sums were put forward for his campaigns. The jester Stefani again takes a chance to cast her into a bad light, stating that she blazed into unbearable fury after asking in an authoritative manner the London nobles cast as the innocent party. However, William of Malmesbury again provides a counterpoint. While he makes no mention of the financial arrangements, he does state that the wealthy Londoners gave vent to expressions of unconcealed hatred towards her. He also boils down Matilda refusing to do as her advisers said to just one incident specifically with Bishop Henry. When he asked her to pass Stephen's personal estate onto his 12-year-old son Eustace while his father was imprisoned at Bristol, she refused. Understandably, as Eustace would likely see her as the usurper of his father's crown, and might well become a powerful enemy to her if he had such rich and powerful lands under his young belt. The bishop was angered by this, and immediately left her court to plot against her something that seems to have been a habit for him when the current monarch didn't pay him heed. His plans had no doubt been for Matilda to do as she was told, and for himself to therefore make his own position more powerful. Her main problems, therefore, were that she had fallen out with Bishop Henry, a man without whom she would not have been titled Lady of England, and that the economically centric London traders refused to acquiesce to Matilda due to their interest in the trade route through Boulogne. This ensured they would support Stephen, as he had promised them commune status and special trade routes through his royal favour. And while it is most likely that she met with resistance due to her commanding and unexpectedly authoritarian approach to her new subjects due to being female, there is also an argument that her manner may well have been somewhat abrasive. This was a woman who had been empress of a grand empire, daughter of the imposing King Henry I, and had her crown usurped from across the channel. It is not impossible that she may not have treated those who had supported Stephen kindly, especially given that their newfound loyalty could flip as quickly the other way if the political situation changed. And while from Matilda's point of view she was behaving as any new male ruler might have done, the unexpected juxtaposition of female and king appeared not to rest easy with many of her subjects. It's unlikely that any woman in her position at that time would have found herself more accepted. Even if Matilda had been the sort of woman who would act, as the Jester Stefani suggests, modestly and becoming to her gentle sex, she probably wouldn't have been a strong leader. And it was this unfortunate place that Matilda found herself in as she prepared for her coronation in Westminster, as she met resistance once more to her rule. But it wasn't actually Stephen himself who rallied the citizens of England against her, but his queen, Matilda of Boulogne. The Jester Stefani rapturously praised Matilda of Boulogne for bearing herself with the valour of a man in pursuit of returning the crown to her husband's head. The difference between them was that Empress Matilda was acting on her own authority, attempting to take on a role normally held by a man. Matilda of Boulogne, by contrast, was acting on behalf of her husband, seen as the proper place for a queen consort. When pleading intervention to both Bishop Henry to refute Matilda's claim, and then to Matilda asking for her husband's release failed, Matilda of Boulogne turned quickly to warfare. She ordered her husband's Flemish mercenaries to march from her lands in Kent 
to rage most furiously around the city with plunder and arson, violence and the sword. The outcome of this put fear into medieval Londoners, fear of what an army loyal to Stephen could do to their city. They had already accepted Matilda as queen only reluctantly. In doing so, they were giving up lucrative trade routes and promises of self-government. Ever worried about the economic ramifications of their decisions, they began to consider their paper thin alliance to a queen who was a rival to Stephen. While Matilda was busy planning her coronation, they secretly made peace with Matilda of Boulogne. The result was terrible for Empress Matilda. On the 24th of June, 1141, Londoners swiftly made their way across to the Palace of Westminster, armed and now firmly declaring for Stephen and his Queen. Empress Matilda and her small retinue had no choice but to flee making for the safety of her castle at Oxford. With her retreat went the chance of becoming Crown Queen of England. Without a hold on the capital, without being anointed Queen, her cause seemed lost. After learning of Bishop Henry's betrayal, Matilda rallied her forces and made for Winchester to secure the city and its treasury. Unfortunately, the Bishop had already fled the city and his palace. While Robert of Gloucester, Miles of Gloucester and Brian Fitzcount found themselves besieging the city, Bishop Henry had already sent word for help to Matilda of Boulogne. It was sent in the form of William of Ypres and his forces, who encircled Robert's army, and soon violence followed. Unfortunately stuck between the advancing forces and the city of Winchester behind, Robert and Miles of Gloucester had no choice but to rally for one last stand to buy time for Matilda's escape. They managed this on the 14th of September, Matilda fleeing to Devies Castle in Wiltshire with the loyal Brian Fitzcount by her side. After reaching the safety of her castle, however, she was met with more unfortunate news. Robert of Gloucester had failed to hold his position and was now captured by the enemy. Matilda now had no choice but to negotiate the release of Robert in exchange for Stephen. Putting aside any sentimental feeling Matilda may have had for the safety and well-being of her half-brother, he was also the man whose lands and men guaranteed her position. The two men were exchanged, Stephen leaving Bristol as Robert left Winchester both leaving behind wives and sons as reassurance of safety for the other. Once both parties were received in their respective estates, the two sides resumed the positions they had held before the Battle of Lincoln, and once more a stalemate fell over England. However, while Matilda and Stephen had been entangled in their battles in England, her husband Geoffrey had not stood still in Normandy. He had marched across the duchy, taking lands to the point that his hold over Normandy was now absolute. It left those with lands on both sides of the channel with a difficult decision to make. It was clear that if Stephen was to regain his footing and claim a decisive victory, he would have to deal with Geoffrey's unstoppable rise in France. In order to build up her forces against Stephen, Matilda took advantage of a lull due to Stephen falling ill in the spring of 1141 to ask her husband for reinforcements. Meeting with a council of her supporters in Devise, it was decided that Robert should be sent to Normandy to request help from Matilda's husband. William of Malmesbury stating, it being Geoffrey's duty to maintain the inheritance of his wife and children in England. But Geoffrey was too wrapped up in his own interests of claiming the Dukedom of Normandy that he instead delayed Robert's return, using the Earl to help his own cause. This put Matilda in grave danger. As Stephen's health returned, and he cut off the Earl's return by blocking the port at Wareham, he marched his own forces towards Oxford, successfully trapping Matilda and her attendants within by sieging the castle. When he heard of his sister's plight, Robert moved swiftly to put his ships back on England's shores. Landing at Wareham, 
and taking the garrison and the town. He brought with him the young Henry of Anjou, and he also brought with him 300 knights and 52 ships, suggesting Geoffrey might have provided resources after all, despite his delay in doing so. But three months later, in mid-December 1142, Matilda and her supporters were starving to death inside the freezing castle at Oxford. Matilda's choices were limited, but true to her unbending resolve, she once more decided to escape her cousin's grasp. Just before Christmas, with a deep and cold winter settling in, thick snow providing cover, she made her escape. Some accounts state that she was let down from the castle tower by a rope, but it's more likely she simply slipped out of an unguarded side door. Bringing a small but loyal bodyguard of just three knights, she fled the castle at night. The wintry landscape was to their advantage, as cloaked in white to camouflage against the snow, the four figures slipped across the thick ice that covered the River Thames. They had to walk seven miles through the endless snow, trudging on to Abingdon, where they found horses to carry them a little further to the relative safety of Wallingford and Brian Fitzcount's forces. But despite her daring escape being a success, it effectively called an end to the chances of her ever holding the crown of England. Once more, England was split into two sides, with the countryside's surrounding estates ravaged and pillaged for resources. However, there remained a light for Matilda in the form of her young son, Henry of Anjou. His first visit to England was spent mainly in tutelage at his uncle's castle, but his presence was felt nonetheless. Being female had been the end of Matilda's dreams of claiming her rightful inheritance in the form of nobles who were unable to accept the rule of a woman in a man's position. But her son, was an entirely different prospect. Matilda's inheritance could become his, and as a male heir, the same arguments against her rule could not count against him. It was an easy answer to the question of how to stand by the decision of King Henry I to allow his bloodline to inherit the crown, while preventing the seemingly distasteful act of a woman acting in the manner of a king. For Matilda, it appears to have been an easy decision to make, her maternal and dynastic ambition greater than her own desire to wear England's crown. She now knew that her fight was for her son to become king. For the next six years of the Cold War between herself and Stephen, Matilda suffered losses of those close to her. Her half-brother Robert, Miles of Gloucester, and Brian Fitzcount all succumbed to death, leaving only her West Country strongholds to rely on. Stephen held much of the Midlands and east of the country, but there were many barons and nobles who remained in between the two sides, not declaring for either. In 1148, Matilda finally left England's shores for Normandy. By the summer of 1144, her husband Geoffrey of Anjou was now the Duke of Normandy, and therefore she was the Duchess of Normandy, controlling the duchy through a combination of his wife's inheritance and claim and his own military success. As all Norman lands were finally captured and brought under Geoffrey's control, Stephen no longer held any lands in Normandy, and the chance of him ever recovering them disappeared. His support was on a thin foundation now. While he held most of England, he was growing older and there was no guarantee of his son Eustace claiming the crown he himself had taken on personal ambition, despite the king's attempts to convince the church to crown Eustace in his lifetime. Part of Matilda's decision to leave appears to have been connected to the church and wanting to avoid falling out with the papacy. When the new bishop, Jocelyn de Bohem, demanded the castle at Devise now be returned to him, she came up with a smart plan 
travelling to Caen in 1148 to personally make her peace with the new bishop, she left her forces in the garrison's walls. Writing to her son Henry, she explained the reasons behind her decision and he moved swiftly to return the properties around the castle to the bishop. The 16-year-old Henry then successfully convinced Jocelyn de Bohan that he needed to hold on to the castle long enough for his rightful claim to the throne to be succeeded, keeping the men he needed safely within the castle's walls. By the end of the year, his great uncle, King David of the Scots, had knighted him, and by 1150, his father handed over the reign of Normandy's government as promised. Henry of Anjou was now Duke of Normandy, and Stephen's claim grew ever weaker in this new position of now defending his crown against the legitimate male claimant of Henry I's bloodline. The nobles of England now saw in Henry a chance to reunite a land which had been split apart for almost two decades. When he returned to England in 1153, Henry, Duke of Normandy, was 20 years old, a proven military leader and hungry to reclaim his birthright. Stephen, by contrast, was a king growing older and could no longer rely on the support of the church with whom he had fallen out of favour. The jester Stefani even shifts its support here from Stephen to Henry, recounting how Henry did not fail of splendid success Rather did it come to him more abundantly, the more eagerly he strove for loftier aims. With his father's unfortunate death in 1151, he could add Anjou to his titles, despite incurring the wrath of Louis VII in the process. This was only worsened when Henry married Eleanor of Aquitaine, only recently divorced from the French king because of their closeness as kin, the French king attacked Normandy, only to be easily beaten back by Henry's forces, forced to accept him as the undisputed Duke of Normandy. And so when Henry landed once more on English soil, it was as master of much of the French lands across the Channel, including newly acquired Aquitaine through his new wife. Stephen had to accept reality. His son could find no support amongst the bishops or church, and his nobles had no more appetite for fighting. Any lingering desire to stake a dynastic claim for the crown vanished just a few months later when his eldest son Eustace died. There was no option left but to meet and make a truce. In November 1153, Stephen and Henry met at Winchester, formally making an agreement that Stephen should be allowed to remain king for the rest of his life, while Henry would become his heir and the lawful holder of the crown after Stephen's death. Stephen swore to maintain Henry as though he was his adopted son and personal heir, and the long 19-year anarchy came to a smooth end. Henry did not have to wait long. On the 25th of October, 1154, Stephen succumbed to a severe stomach illness from which he did not recover. The now elderly king, who had held his crown by moving with such speed and self-assurance, died as a pale imitation of himself. Matilda finally had her victory, though it was not the one she had once seen for herself. The cost of that victory was to force her into the shadows of her own story. When the news of Stephen's death reached Henry in Normandy, he took time to put his affairs in order before sailing for his new crown on the 7th of December. In the interim, unlike when his grandfather had died, there was no sign of conflict in England. The country, it seemed, had had its fill of war and wanted only peace. On the 19th of December, 1154, Henry was finally crowned at Westminster nearly 19 years since the death of his grandfather. But what became of Matilda? She set up her new base at Rouen, settling her household there in a property built by her father. 
While she grew, like her mother before her, ever more concerned with spiritual matters, she remained a strong presence in her son's life. She counseled Henry, helping to rule his lands, including England, when he was not present in his travels. The trust Henry had in his mother was clear by the authority which she was allowed to wield in his absence. Over the years, she provided him with advice and guidance, often heeded and still criticised by some for being too hard and cold. But by 1167, she was no longer the forceful woman who had commanded like a king and made daring escapes. Having endured the loss of her two younger sons, she put her energy into ensuring a truce between Henry and Louis VII, succeeding in the summer of that year. Empress Matilda finally died on the 10th of September, 1167, buried by the monks at her beloved Beck Abbey, amongst whom she had spent much of her later life in spiritual contemplation. Her body was sewn into an oxhide and laid to rest before the high altar in the Abbey Church. During her lifetime, she had left many treasures to the Abbey, including two gold crowns she had brought as a young woman from Germany, and now she left them the rich contents of her personal chapel. She was a woman who had been a Norman princess, a German empress and queen, tantalizingly close to being queen of England, and finally finding peace as the king's mother in the quiet of Beck's cloisters. The brief descriptions of the few months when she wielded the power of a female king would impress upon historians ever since the image of a haughty and insufferable woman, obscuring the rest of her life in which she was a competent and intelligent woman of royal birth, fighting only for what was hers by right of birth, if not sex. It is interesting that these descriptions were never used to describe any male member of her family, even when they displayed the same characteristics. What is known of Matilda outside of that brief and fateful moment where she almost touched the crown of England to her brow does not fit with how chroniclers painted her. We know that to her German subject she was Matilda the Good, and that to her son she was an integral and imposing element to his rule. She showed great courage and intelligence in escaping her rival on more than one occasion, rallying the nobles of a country she had been foreign to since she was a child. It is irrelevant to modernize how modest and gentle she was in the face of her fierce determination and resilience. And while the limitations of her sex prevented Matilda from ever imposing her will as Queen of England, her shrewd political mind and motherly resolve ensured the throne for her son. This is most evident in the Latin inscription of her tomb, which reads, Here lies the daughter, wife, and mother of Henry, great by birth, greater by marriage, greatest in her offspring. Her fight had been acknowledged in the crowning of her son, but to pay for that victory, she disappeared into her own story, except as a warning to other female royals. Another 400 years would pass before the subject of a female ruler would be raised again. But despite Matilda's own epitaph describing her life through three men, one of those men was determined that her memory and indomitable will would not be forgotten. The powerful monarch Henry II insisted that he was called Henry Fitz Empress, son of the Empress, in recognition of his mother and her enduring memory as a courageous woman who should have ruled England.